So this is uh, Matthew for Beginners. This is uh, lesson number five. The uh, part of the book that we're in is narrative number two. And if you're following along in your Bibles, please go to Matthew chapter, uh, Matthew chapter eight is where we will, we may be reading a few sections uh, tonight. All right, so uh, in the first discourse, now you, you know what we're talking about, right? Matthew is broken up, very well organized. Narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse, narrative, discourse. So what we're doing, the way we're studying it is, we're studying narrative discourse, okay? So we did the first discourse, meaning discussion, you know, dialogue. And in the first discourse, uh, we saw the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, we, studied the last, uh, we studied last week uh, where Jesus describes the principles upon which the kingdom of God is established. And very briefly, what he said in the first discourse or what he explained in the Sermon on the Mount, one, what true righteousness before God really is. Number two, what a true relationship with God and a true relationship with man, what does it look like? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? That's what he talks about, Sermon on the Mount. And a true response to his word. And then finally he, finished, he describes the kingdom. In other words, what is inside and how do you get into the kingdom? So this is, this is all a discussion that, was, uh, that we looked at last time as we discussed the first discourse. So the narrative that follows this discourse is a description of the power upon which this kingdom is established and the way that men have access to that power. So he describes the kingdom, this is what it's like, this is what it looks like, it feels like, so on and so forth. It's how you get into it. That's what he talked about in the discourse. Now he's going to demonstrate how is that kingdom established? What is it based on? What, by what power does this kingdom exist? Okay? So in John, I'm going to just go over to another passage for a moment. In John chapter 21, verse 25, the Apostle John says that the world could not contain all of what Jesus did. Remember he says, but this has been given so that you might believe. This is certainly true when we think um, uh, of, the, of the books, the millions of articles and so on and so forth about Jesus and His life and related material about Him. And just for fun, I googled the, just the term Jesus, just one name, Jesus, I googled that. 587 million results. 587 million, that's just the name. I didn't even put a topic. I didn't put Jesus' miracles or Jesus the Son of God or Jesus' salvation. I didn't do that. I just put Jesus, <laughs> 587 million um, uh, results. And so uh, I'm saying this to say, you know, when John said, not everything you know, is written in this book that could be written about Jesus, but if it was, the world couldn't contain the books. Well, that's exactly, that's exactly true. Now, th there's a reason why I've mentioned this. Matthew's narrative in chapter eight and nine is a good example of the reasons why this is so, why there's so much stuff. When comparing the different accounts of the material contained in these two chapters, we see why John said that not everything was recorded. There was just too much, okay? So here is a summary of the activity of Jesus during three particular days. In other words, a three-day stretch, all right? And I've put them in chronological order for you. This is not how Matthew writes them, but I've put them in chronological order. So three days in the life of Jesus, just three days out of three years, you ready? Day number one the Sermon on the Mount. Then after the sermon, he comes down and he heals the leper after finishing his lesson. Then he goes to Capernaum, which is his hometown. That's where he and both Peter live. On the way to his town, he heals the centurion's slave. And then when he gets to Peter's house, because apparently they were going to eat at Peter's house, he heals Peter's mother in law, not mother, but mother in law, and then she feeds him. And then it says, as the evening drew near, many, many people were brought to him and he continued healing all kinds of 
illnesses, I guess from Peter's house. That's day one, imagine. Just one thing like that would create a colossal you know, wave of news and information, that, but that's just one day. Day number two, he orders the disciples to cross over the Sea of Galilee. And then he teaches them about you know, the would-be disciples. Many of them, you know, they're getting ready to cross and some would-be disciples say, hey boy, you know, I mean, I'll follow you anywhere. You know that passage? And Jesus teaches them about the cost of discipleship. Then they're on the boat, he calms the storm. And then when they get to the other side, he heals the demoniacs upon arriving on the other side. Then they cross back over the Sea of Galilee, back to Capernaum. And then he heals the paralytic that is, that is brought to him there. And then in that same day he calls Matthew to come and follow him. That's day two. And then day three, he has dinner with the disciples and Matthew at Matthew's house, or a meal with them. And while there he teaches the Pharisees and John's disciples about the nature of the kingdom. He's always talking about the kingdom. This is the day where he resurrects the official's daughter, you know, the, the synagogue official, we'll talk about that. And while he's on his way to do that, he heals the woman who has the hemorrhage of blood. He also heals a blind man. And he also heals a man who is dumb and demon-possessed, that's day three. You know how much stuff has been written just about these events? The commentaries and the comments and the lessons and the sermons and the books and the, oh my, encyclopedias written about just a few of these things. And this is just three days in his, in his life. Now, Matthew does not arrange these events exactly in this order, but he organizes the material in the following way and probably does so, so it's easier to teach. Remember I said that his book was used as an instruction book? So here's how Matthew organizes the very same material. You ready? So what Matthew does is he starts with the first three miracles and then a section of teaching another three miracles that he describes, a section of teaching, four more miracles, and then he finishes with a summary teaching. So there are 10 miracles described, and the teaching has a variety of subjects, but the most important theme in this section here on the, you know, the three kind of little teaching sections here, the most important theme is that of discipleship. Okay? So Matthew has divided, or excuse me, has described the nature of the kingdom. He's described the nature of the kingdom in the Sermon on the Mount. He's demonstrated the power of the kingdom through the miracles that he describes Jesus doing. He then instructs on the way into the kingdom. And he teaches, well, he shows that Jesus says the way into the kingdom is through faith. Faith demonstrated in obedience. And then the call that Jesus makes to everyone to enter into the kingdom, and that is the call to discipleship. All right, so what I've done here in the first section is I've given you a big overview. I've given you three days, chopped up the material that way, then I've shown you how Matthew organizes the, the material. Miracle teaching, miracle teaching, okay? Now we're going to go, we're going to drill down a little bit and we're going to actually look at these individual events and I'm going to give you some commentary to try to fill in some of the background information, maybe some stuff that you don't you know, see right away. So we start in chapter eight as Matthew describes the first group of miracles which are then followed by teaching. So the very first one is the leper who is cleansed. Uh, Matthew 8, 1 to 4. Again, don't have time to read this. I always tell you, read ahead so you'll have read the material. Um, I want you to notice that in this passage here, there is a, a demonstration of faith. 
this man, this leper, believed that Jesus could actually heal him. And Jesus did. So note that Jesus heals this man who believes in Jesus. Okay. Now Jesus touches him, it says, goes against the convention, not allowed to touch someone who had leprosy, you would become unclean, but Jesus is the Lord of healing, doesn't have to worry about that. Uh, then he tells this man to go show himself to a priest, and the reason for that is the man had to confirm that he was actually healed from leprosy so that he would then be allowed to go back to normal life. He would be allowed to come into the synagogue, he would be able to go to the wor worship, in other words, he would have uh, the possibility of having social interaction because his healing was confirmed by a priest. So that's why Jesus tells him to do that. The next miracle, the centurion slave. Very interesting. So the centurion, okay, he's a commander, commander of a, 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 a group of a hundred uh, soldiers. Um, it is said that he's a pious man, he's a proselyte, meaning he's a believer. He's not a Jew by culture, but he's a believer even built a synagogue for the people, and he addresses Jesus as Lord, which demonstrates his faith. And he also took Jesus at his word, because the slave was not with him, his slave was at home. The centurion comes to Jesus, tells Jesus, you don't have to come to my house, I know that if you just give the word, my slave will be healed. And Jesus marvels at the quality of his faith, and I've always thought, imagine, you impress Jesus. You know, we want to impress our bosses or we want to impress our girlfriend or something, you know what I'm saying? But impressing Jesus, I, you know, it never crosses my mind to actually do something that will impress Jesus. Obey Jesus, okay. Depend on Jesus, yeah, I get that part. Believe Jesus, yes, I'm always doing that. But impress Him, eh, not so much. And yet, Jesus Himself is impressed by this man. Now I want you to notice that the servant is healed simply by a word, and he was not there. In other words, it wasn't the servant's faith, the servant didn't know, it was the centurion's faith. So two different things, the leper believed and the leper was healed. We get to the next miracle, the centurion believes, but the, it's somebody else who's who's healed, all right, so keep that in mind. Then the third miracle, Peter's mother-in-law, and then the general miracles that take place at Peter's house afterwards. Again, she's healed without any discourse. She's healed immediately. It says he walked in, she's sick, he touches her, she's immediately healed and begins serving the group. Anybody here knows that if you have a fever, you know, when the fever breaks, Seems to me you feel kind of weak when the fever breaks, you know, you're, uh, you're done, you're drained. Here she gets up and she's full of energy, so she was healing her. Many people were brought to Jesus with physical, emotional, spiritual ailment. Matthew shows that this miraculous healing power of Jesus was in accord with prophecy, so he goes out of his way to make sure that his readers understand that the miracles he, were, he was doing were just not random things, they were things done by the one who was called the Messiah. In other words, the prophets said when the Messiah comes there'll be miracles, and so Jesus is doing the miracles to demonstrate one facet of his fulfillment of that prophecy. So there's the first group of miracles. Then we go to teaching, teaching, would-be disciples, so let's read a few verses here in the teaching part. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to depart to the other side of the sea. Then a, a scribe came and said to him, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, The foxes have holes and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Another disciple said to him, Lord, permit me first to go bury my father. But Jesus said to him, Follow me and allow the dead to bury their own dead. So here are the instructions to would-be disciples. You know, he, he warns of the otherworldly experience of the kingdom. Those people, you know, when he says, you know, I, I, the, you know, the foxes have place, people have place to lay their heads, but the Son of Man, it didn't mean he didn't have a place to stay. 
He was not saying to would-be disciples, if you're going to be my disciples, you're going to have to you know, like, uh, have no clothes and no place to stay, no money. You, know, you have to live like a monk. He wasn't saying that. He was saying that if you're going to become my disciples, more and more, you're not going to feel comfortable in this world. It's just, you know, you're going to live in it. You're going to have to eat the food and you know, drive your car. But more and more as you enter into the kingdom, as you grow spiritually, you're going to feel uncomfortable in this place. You're going to begin longing to be with the Lord. Okay, that's what he's saying. The people who belong to this world, they belong to this world. They love this world. They don't want to leave this world. They're hanging on with all their might. They want just you know, five more minutes of, of life if they can have it. And those who are in the kingdom, they live in this world, they do what they need to do. And any of you who have attended a Christian's funeral know that there's an element of sadness, but we're happy that that brother or that sister, their burden is finally over. They can finally go home and to be with the Lord where they want to be, where all of us want to be. So that's what he's, that's what he's saying. We're pilgrims, we're passing through. Now, especially for a Jew, a Jew, you know, it says, and a scribe said to him, you know, I'll follow you anywhere. So especially for a Jewish scribe whose identity was so tied up with the history and the culture and the geography of his people, it would be very, very hard to identify with Christ rather than the physical religion based in history that they were following. So disciples, you know, they make their home here but they're not at home until they're with Christ. There's a, there's a difference there, okay? So let's be careful to not allow anyone to use this passage to impose on us, you know, oh, you have to live like an ascetic, you mustn't own anything, you know, you, no. But you can't support that idea from what he's saying here. Now, uh, he also talks about the dead, burying the dead, right? Dead, burying the dead. Uh, what does this mean? Well, he's saying, let the spiritually dead worry about the things of this world. Don't let these things hold you back from following Jesus. He's not talking that they're physically dead. He's not talking about zombies. He's just saying, you know, let the dead, those who are dead spiritually, who have no faith, who have no interest in God, whose only interest is in this world and what they can get out of this world, let them worry about this world. Let them dig the holes and bury the dead you know, like they're dead. You're alive spiritually. You got things to do in the kingdom. You, come on, you, you don't, you know, don't get bogged down by this, by this world. So there's the teaching about would-be disciples. Is that all the teaching about? Well, no, of course not. There's lots of teaching about would-be disciples, but there's some teaching that he gives here. Okay, let's move on. So now we go to more miracles. He goes on to describe another group first of which is calming the storm. The apostles appealed to Jesus in fear to save them from the storm. Must have been a bad storm because they were fishermen, so they're used to being out in the boat. They had little faith, not no faith. They had faith, but it was kind of weak, and their weakness was demonstrated in fear. So this miracle demonstrates the power of Jesus over nature. And I'll tell you something, I have never seen a modern faith healer ever demonstrate power over nature. They'll say, oh, I can cure cancer, I can cure your headache or your bad back, or, you know, but I've never seen them calm a storm, grow a tree, you know, just speak to a tree and that tree withers, you know, so on and so forth. I've never seen them even attempt such a thing. Now you see fake magicians and things like that, you know, people, they bend spoons, you know, they bend spoons with their mind, but we know those are tricks, those are just magic tricks. They've been you know, exposed uh, by uh, people, what was the name of the great magician in the past there? Uh, Houdini, remember Houdini? One of Houdini's things is he used to expose all of these uh, people who were frauds uh, because he, he, he knew that these things were simply tricks and he would go around and try to expose 
uh, the, the uh, tricksters and those who said that they could contact the dead or they heard voices and he would, he would demonstrate and expose these, uh, uh, these people. Never thought I'd be talking about Houdini while we're talking about Matthew, but anyways. So calming the storm, the significance of that, as I said, is it demonstrates his power over nature, another area of power that he has. Next miracle, casting out of demons. The demoniacs, very dangerous and possessed by many demons. And it says here the demons were afraid of him. Well, they were afraid of him because they were afraid that their judgment was at hand. They knew the results of their judgment, but they didn't know the time. And so when Jesus came, they were afraid, they shrieked because they thought, uh oh, now's the time of their judgment. Okay. Of course, no one knows that time. You know, if the spirits don't know when the judgment is, surely no humans know it either. So he casts them out with a word, simply tells them to leave, and, uh, and when he does so, he himself is asked to leave. The people are afraid. And then the third uh, miracle here, the paralytic who is cured, chapter nine. First, Jesus forgives his sin, remember? And the Pharisees grumble and others grumble because they feel Jesus has no right or power to do this. And they're right. A man does not have the power to forgive sins you know, in the place of God. If you steal $10 from me and you come to me and say, you know, I, I, I gave into temptation, it was 10 bucks on your, uh, on your coffee table and I took it, I apologize, here's your $10 back, you know, I forgive you, I can do that. You know, but I can't forgive you for the sin that you did you know, for, from God. So they were right in accusing him of that if he was not God, but he is God. And of course, the, the miracle he makes is simply to demonstrate his power. He said, hey, if I can do this miracle, if I have that power, well then I also have the power to forgive sin because only God could do this miracle. So if, if I do this miracle, I prove that I am divine. Therefore, I also have the power to forgive sin. And they glorified, it says they glorified him or they glorified God um, after he did that miracle. And of course, that's one of the reasons why miracles are done to give glory to God. So we go to a next section, a section of teaching. You see how it works? Miracles, teaching, miracles, teaching. Chapter nine, I'm going to read a few verses. It says, as Jesus went on from there, he saw a man called Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. Then it happened that as Jesus was reclining at the table in the house, behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and were dining with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why is your teacher eating with the tax collectors and sinners? But when Jesus heard this, he said, it is not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire compassion and not sacrifice, for I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Then the disciples of John came to him asking, why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? And Jesus said to them, the attendants of the bridegroom cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them, can they? But the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will fast. But no one puts a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch pulls away from the garment, and a worse tear results. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. So let's see some of the things that happen in that section, right? First of all, Matthew is called. Note how simply Matthew writes about his own calling and his response. Just a, a wonderful example of humility. He gives his name, he gives his former life, he was a tax collector, he gives his call and his response. And the interesting thing is, if you don't see it, is he uses the third person in referring to himself, not I, but he, and no dialogue from Jesus to himself. You know, what, a, what an opportunity. You know, if Jesus had called me, oh my goodness, you know, I remember it well, it was a Tuesday. You know, and I was feeling a little down on that Tuesday and along comes Jesus and he looks at me. He looked right at me. 
And he smiled and he said, Michael, how would you like to come and follow me? And I mean, I didn't waste a moment. I was there. I said, Lord, you know, then he said to me, you know, TMI, TMI, too much information. Matthew recounts probably the most significant, not probably, the most significant moment in his life with just a few words in the third person, no dialogue, just I was a sinner, he called me, I followed. Boom, that's the end. And in his, in his, uh, in his gospel, doesn't ever refer to himself. This is the only time, imagine, writing the entire gospel, referring to himself only this, this, simple, uh, this simple time. Then there's the uh, accusation about eating with sinners. And Jesus' response was that his ministry was one of compassion, not one of ceremony. Their point was, you're not following the ceremony, you're not washing your, they don't just mean hygiene, they didn't even understand the hygienic implication of washing their hands in those days. They didn't know about germs. They're talking about you know, the ritual cleaning and the ritual cleaning and the ceremony that goes into, uh, into, into the eating, into the social grace. They're basically saying, your people uh, have no class. Your people have no class. They're not following the you know, they're not following the rituals. And Jesus is saying to them, my ministry, I didn't come here for ceremony. He's not putting ceremony down. He's just saying, That's, I, I'm not a, I didn't come here as the priest or to teach you ceremony. I'm here because of compassion. That's my ministry. Miracles of healing and ministry of the cross motivated by compassion in order to glorify God and to save souls. That's what I'm here for. And nothing glorifies God more than soul saving and service, not ceremony. Again, don't get me wrong. The, the, the few things that you know, the Bible gives us to do that have somewhat of a ceremony in it, you know, the communion that we do on the Lord's Supper on Sunday and the baptism when someone becomes a Christian, right? Those are ceremonies in a way, of course, they're things to do. And of course, we have instructions on how to do those things and how to do them properly and so on and so forth. But our religion is not based on just carrying out these ceremonies. You wouldn't think that sometimes when you hear people talk. Now those, simply, those ceremonies are there to reflect what is really going on, forgiveness of sins and reception of the Spirit at baptism and remembering the sacrifice of Jesus at communion. That's why we do those things. All right, then he talks about John's disciples. And the question is, why do John's disciples, uh, like John and the Pharisees, why did they fast? And Jesus' disciples, they don't fast. So we know that the Pharisees fasted on a regular basis as part of their religious practice, much of which was hypocritical. And John and his disciples fasted partly because of their Jewish conditioning by the Pharisees, but also partly because their leader, John, was an ascetic. He lived in a desert. He drank no wine. He, he ate honey and locusts. You know? He was that type of an ascetic, uh, self-denial uh, type of uh, prophet. And so his, his followers also did the same thing. They prayed and fasted. In addition to that, by this time, John was in jail. And so his disciples were praying and fasting, hoping that he would be saved, he would be released. Now Jesus responds with a couple of examples. First, Jesus' appearance is one of joy. The king of the kingdom has come, and like the appearance of a bridegroom at a wedding, it's time for feasting, not fasting. When he is killed, he says, and that's a prophecy of his own cross, then there'll be plenty of time to fast, plenty of reason to fast, but not now, not during the, the time he's there. Then he talks about the patch and the wineskin. Very interesting, the patch and the wineskin. 
As I said, the reason the Pharisees' uh, disciples fasted was because it was imposed on them by their leaders and by tradition. And the reason that John's disciples fasted was because of the example of John and the fact that he was in jail at the time. Jesus didn't lay this condition on His disciples, and since He was with them, they rejoiced in His presence. There was no need to fast. Now the verses about the patch and the wineskin refer to spiritual condition. Uh, spiritual condition. Um, Jesus did not reveal to them, meaning the Pharisees, like He did for His disciples, who were the new garment and the new wineskin, Jesus does not reveal to the unbelievers and the mockers and the Pharisees the details of His death and resurrection because they didn't believe. So you know, we're always trying to figure out who is what. Well, the old wineskin and the old cloth, those are the non-believers, the Pharisees the people that rejected Jesus. They're the old wineskin, they're the old cloth. If you put the patch on, a, on, a, on, a, on, a, on an, on an old, cloth, a new patch, old cloth, it'll tear, okay? So he was the new patch, and they in their disbelief, they were the old cloth, they were the old wineskin. He was the new wine, and they in their disbelief were the old wineskins, and the point he's making is that their disbelief would destroy them. You know, the new patch on the old garment would destroy the garment. The new patch or the new wine in the old wineskin would destroy the wineskin. So them not accept him, he's putting on them you know, who he is and they don't accept it, they're going to be destroyed. That's the parallel there. That's what's going on. Their disbelief would destroy them. You know, the parables of Jesus, remember, He's always at the center of the thing. You, if you figure out what part He is, you usually have the key to open the, um, not the riddle, it's not a riddle, but the, uh, but the parable, okay? So then we get to another, um, another uh, group of uh, miracles. Uh, in uh, verses 18, the official's daughter, so the official is a, a, like an elder in the church today. The official of the synagogue would be one of the leaders of the synagogue. Asked Jesus to save his dying daughter. And of course Jesus arrives after the child has died. He resurrects her from the dead. And this miracle prefigures, remember we, in another whole series, remember I talked to you about billboarding? You, know, you put billboards to let people know what's coming down the road. Well, in the Bible you have billboarding. You know? Well, this is a billboard example. By, the res by resurrecting this child from the dead, he's pre prefiguring his own resurrection. And then you have the woman with the hemorrhage, and, and this is in between, right? He's asked to come and heal this child. He agrees to go, and as he is going, the woman comes, and the woman with the hemorrhage for 12 years, she touches his garment, okay, and he heals her and has a conversation with her, and when that's done, then he goes to the child and resurrects uh, the child. So this miracle is performed in between the request and the healing. Now, this event is described in much greater detail in Mark chapter 5, verse 21 to 34, and Luke 8, 43 to 48, but Matthew preserves the account in its order with the request from the synagogue official before and after. In other words, he keeps the same, you know, the same order of events. Uh, what's interesting to note is that Jesus healed the woman based on her faith, but he raised the dead child as a response to the father's faith. See the diff? So this encourages us to not only pray for ourselves, but also pray for others as well, because God answers all prayers and asked in faith. I can ask for me, my faith, but I can also with confidence ask God for someone else. Because I see the example in the New Testament that God answers a prayer of faith on behalf of someone else who may not even be aware that you're praying for them. That child was dead. 
So you see many times people asking Jesus to do something for someone who has not even asked, who's not even aware. So that gives me kind of encouragement, you know, that I, you know, I pray for my uncle or I pray for my whatever, a relative or friend who's not a Christian or who's not praying themselves, you know, but I know that God will hear me on their behalf. All right? And then we get the, uh, the dumb and demon possessed in chapter nine. The significance of this miracle when seen alongside all the other miracles performed, you know, raising the dead, calming the sea, was that no one else in their history of prophets and miracle workers, no one else had singularly demonstrated power over the creation, over the spirit world, over disease and over death as Jesus had. You had some prophets that did one thing, another, you know, Samson did other great things and different prophets did other you know, miraculous things and so on and so forth, but there was never one individual that had power over all of these things. But Jesus did. They even said, we've never seen this kind of miracle before. So this kind of power demonstrated that it, was, that it could only be from God. All right. And so when we get to the end of this section, we have the summary, verses 35 to 38, Matthew is saying, you know, Jesus, the Lord of the harvest, you know, send workers, He's the Lord of the harvest. You know. So Matthew summarizes the nature of Jesus' ongoing ministry, teaching, preaching, healing. The teaching and the call to discipleship is followed by a prayer for a response and in the next section, the selection of and the sending out of the disciples to multiply the teaching and the preaching and the miracles done by Jesus. So he prays here you know, that we, 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 the, the, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. You know, he prays that here. And then in the next section, you're going to see him go out and you know, select disciples and apostles and so on and so forth. Okay? So we have through Matthew's eyes and his pen a description of the everyday life of the king as he goes about establishing his kingdom in the hearts of men and women, and he does this through his miraculous power and his inspired teaching, and Matthew you know, describes this in very, very uh, clear, um, and in a very, very clear and organized way. Easy to remember the way he groups the material together, okay? So next time, uh, read discourse number two, Matthew 9, 35 to Matthew 10, 42. And we'll just keep on going all the way through the book of Matthew. <laughs>